Earlier this month, Massachusetts' highest court issued a ruling that has the potential to affect colleges and universities across the nation and their students as well. The Supreme Judicial Court ruled that MIT could not be held responsible for the 2009 suicide of one of its students. And while there are certain cases in which a school could be liable, such as when a student directly declares an intention to commit suicide and the school fails to act to address the situation, but in most cases, the ruling finds universities, quote, are not responsible for monitoring and controlling all aspects of the students' lives according to the court. But the reality is schools across the country are struggling to keep up with what many consider to be a health, mental health crisis on their campuses. A 2017 American College Health Association survey found that nearly 40% of college students said they felt so depressed in the prior year it was difficult for them to function. 61% reported feeling, quote, overwhelming anxiety. For years, MIT has held the disturbing distinction of a higher-than-average suicide rate, and after six students and a professor took their lives in 2014 and 15, a shadow fell across the entire community. That's when MIT computer science professor Daniel Jackson, he started a project photographing people on campus who experienced anxiety or depression and wanted to share their stories. He put it all together in a book. It's called Portraits of Resilience. Daniel Jackson joins me now. Good to see you. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Either side of him are two of the many people featured in his book. Haley Cope, now a senior at MIT. Haley, nice to meet you. And Katarina Colon, who graduated from the school and now works there as a research associate at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Good to meet you. Thanks. I got it. It took me a while, but I got it. What made you start this project, Daniel? Why'd you do it? Well, you know, we'd taken some really great strides in destigmatizing depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. You know, but we'd left out in the dark the very people who had the most to teach us about these things. And I thought that if I could make a gallery of faces and stories of people who'd actually experienced depression and anxiety, then people who were suffering could read these stories, look at these faces, and realize they were not alone. What does resilience mean in your title, Portraits of Resilience? What's the word mean? Why the choice? Well, it means different things to different people. And, you know, there are 22 stories yeah. in the book, and... Um, and they all found resilience in their own way. But I think it means you know, finding strength um, in the you know, context of great hardship and adversity um, and reaching insights and wisdom that, that we can all benefit from. You know, both of your stories, as I said before, are so powerful, and I admire your courage in telling them. Kelly, starting with you, can you tell us a little bit of the story you tell that people will hopefully read when they buy the book? Yes, sir. Um so Did you just call me sir? Yes, sir. You're talking to sorry. me? Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's very I'm polite. Kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell a little bit of what you said. Absolutely. So um, basically the story goes, grew up in rural Pennsylvania, spent a lot of time trying very hard to come to this fine institution, um, but had a backdrop of a lot of family chaos and a lot of my own mental health struggles, which reached a peak around the year you described of... Um, the string of student suicides. That was your freshman year, right? Yes, when sir. most of those happened? They were. And did you feel alone? I mean, did you feel there was no one there to help you? or what, what? No, I knew that there was help available, that I just needed to make sure that I would receive it. Um, one of the suicides was in my dormitory, and so I witnessed the aftermath of all of that and seeing how crushed everyone around us was. So... I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to cause that kind of negative community impact. And Katarina, tell us a little bit about the story you told in this book, if you would, about yourself. Yeah, um, so in the book I talk about my experience coming to MIT, um, but uh, freshly, I guess, orphaned. Um, my mom passed away suddenly in April 2011, and then I moved to campus on in August 2011. Um, and I think most of the like the actual story is within that first and second year how I really struggled to kind of come to terms with everything that had happened but then at the same time I was majorly struggling at school and it was hard for me to like not separate those and life just became kind of a mess for the first three years there um, until I was able to get help and and kind of come like I took a year off and then I came back to school and things got much better. And by the way, Sean Collier's sister was sitting in that chair a couple of weeks ago. His killing, murder, by one of the Sarnayevs, or both of the Sarnayevs, yeah. had factored into some of this, correct? It did, yeah. Um, that was April 2013. And April is usually a hard month because um, my mom died during mm -hmm. April. And 
and yeah, and, and, I, and I remember everything happening, and it was a very stressful time. <laughs> How, why do you, both of you, why did you choose the, t I, I don't like telling people where I had lunch, frankly. <laughs> and, and when I'm reading your stories, they're so raw and so honest. Why did you decide it was important for you to do what you did and tell this story? Um, I wanted people, I think there were two different uh, reasons. One is I wanted to, if people were going through something similar, I wanted to see that like someone else had done that too, because that's not something mm -hmm. I didn't have like someone who had gone through everything I'd gone through, or at least not that I knew of right on campus. And then the other part was like, I thought it was a cool way to, for, for people who haven't experienced any kind of mental health or like don't really know anyone who has, which like it's a thing, um, for them to see how other people live, right. To like, to, for them to see other people's stories, I think was important. So was the same motivation for you? A similar, yes. Uh, there's a strong stigma against hospitalization at school because there's the impression that if one becomes hospitalized, then one will be kicked out of MIT and will have a struggle to get back and won't graduate. So I really wanted to emphasize that hospitalization is a valid course of treatment that won't necessarily ruin your life. Are you, did you, is the goal here, is the hope that by these 22 people, two of whom are sitting on either side of you, having the courage to share their story, the thousands who are not in the book and tens of thousands, if not millions across the country, get some strength and understand, is that the hope that it trickles out so. to everybody yes. else? And in fact, you know, we've already had a few signs that that's happening. Like what? Well, there was an incredible story actually of uh, a student who read the book. In fact, we gave the book, based on a very generous alumni donation, we gave the book to all the incoming students oh, you did. Uh, this year. And one of them actually wrote to one of the participants in the book, to Professor John Belcher, who had been mm -hmm. photographed and told his story, um, and, and told him, it's only because of reading your story that I was able to get out of bed today. So that was incredibly Have powerful. you gotten any such feedback, either of the two of you, from people, fellow yeah. students? Yeah. I think I got it a lot. Um, the book, before it became a book, it was actually on our school newspaper right, on the, the tech. tech. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and at the time, I remember receiving a lot of positive feedback. How's that feel? And it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was just weird because, like, I mean, it's, it is very raw. You said so yourself. And I just thought it was strange that people knew. Do you think this, I mentioned in the beginning, this, the state's highest court came down with this decision saying MIT is not responsible for a suicide that happened there in 2009, but schools could be responsible if the warning signs were such that they were right in their face and they failed to act. Is, were you satisfied with that decision? Do you think it went far enough? To be Does honest, you know, to be honest I'm, I'm trying to look at the bigger picture. And from my point what of view... What is the bigger picture? Well, the bigger picture is the reason everyone's interested in this decision is because it's happening everywhere. It's a universal problem. And MIT has actually been incredibly helpful in promoting this project and supporting it. Um, That's because they were unhelpful prior to this project. Isn't that a fair statement? I don't think so. I think okay. you know, a lot of good people at MIT did, did a lot of good things. And we, you know, these tragedies happened, and uh, we obviously need to do more as a society and as individuals. And, and this project, to me, is a way of beginning this conversation about what we need to do at universities to do more. What's the primary message you say to a student or a faculty member who uh, decided not to share their story, may not be at MIT, but who's experiencing some of the same level of stress that you have quickly, if you can? What do you say to them? Um, that they're... Even when it doesn't seem like it, there is hope and there's always more help. How about you? Um, I think it's fair not to want to share your story, but um, I think reaching out for help is really important and that's extremely hard to do. So if you can do that, that's great. Um, and if you have the resources to do it, which not everyone has, then try and take advantage of those if you can. And I do, I assume you agree, only have 15 seconds, it does help to destroy the remaining stigma that exists around mental health issues across the population, not just the university. Right. Do you not agree? Well, we haven't destroyed it yet, but I think we're well on the way. <laughs> I hope you and are. And I think these incredible people are helping a lot. Stories are powerful. By the way, your photographs are otherworldly. They really capture the essence of Thank everybody. You so much. It's a pleasure to meet you, Haley. Thank you so much, Thank you. Daniel. Congratulations. Thank you. Katarina, good luck. Thank really you. We appreciate it. all three of you. Thank Thanks you. so much for being here. The book again is Portraits of Resilience. I get it. And you can find out more information online at portraitsofresilience.com.